Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited uh, for this presentation. I tried to get a lot of good information in here. I know it said one hour. <laughs> I'll try to do our best. I know we had a ton of questions last time. I had a bunch of stuff um, from behind the scenes, you know, people texting me, DMing me. Um, so again, just welcome everybody. So happy to be here. Super grateful to SDI. SDI has made this entire thing possible. Um, SDI makes obviously the bleach that I use in my office every day. Um, so yeah, again, this would not be possible without them. So we're going to kind of start off where we left off last time. For those of you that missed it, um, I'm Dr. Miles Cohn. Um, many folks know me as a, as a dental technician. I think a lot of people are surprised to find out that I'm actually a board certified prosthodontist as well. Um, and, you know, many of you guys follow me on Instagram. And again, those of you that have seen me on Instagram know that I, I restore a lot of implants. I do a lot of dentures. I, you know, do a lot of, a lot of really, really cool stuff. And one of the things that I actually don't show that often on my Instagram account is my whitening, which happens to be my very favorite procedure. It's my most favorite procedure. And I went over this last time, you know, there's a lot of reasons why whitening is my most favorite procedure to do. Um, and those reasons namely are it's easy. Patients absolutely love it. And for those of you that are counting your dollars, which if you own your own private practice, you certainly are. It's a big ROI. There's a big return on investment with bleaching. Um, it's huge. And so as promised uh, for this, this go around part two, we're going to talk about whitening for various different specialties. Um, we're also going to talk about some of the marketing. I promised that I'd show some of that, some of the behind the scenes stuff uh, for that. Um, so to continue on where we were, was this like a month ago? <laughs> it's like a month ago. Um, you know, I, I brought up this question of, you know, when we last met, like, what do you do when you're, when you're whitening, right? And you've got that little tube of bleach, you're doing in-office whitening for many of your patients and you get that last little nubbin, right? Like, what do you do with this stuff? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I do. I give it to my endodontist. I, I do right by my endodontist and I give him a bunch of this because that little, little schmiggity sh bit of bleach there is just enough to fit into a pulp chamber. I can't really use it for much. By the time I've extruded that last little bit out, it, you know, fills the tip and there's, there's not enough to get, you know, maybe on one tooth. Um, so I give it to my endodontist. I keep my endodontist happy. And he uses it inside the pulp chamber of his teeth. So we're going to go through, this is case study number one today. I think we've got eight, eight different case studies we're going to go through. Um, and we're going to talk about the walking bleach technique. Um, so this is Jane. Jane's 52-year-old female, uh, super nice patient. Um, she came in and um, we did a, an in-office whitening session for her. Um, because her chief complaint was that, you know, she wanted to whiten, um, she wanted to brighten up uh, her upper left central incisor. And you guys can see here, it's a little bit darker um, than the right one. I got to keep in mind our audience. So for those of you that are United, in the U.S., tooth number nine is the darker one, right? And for my foreign colleagues and friends, I think that'd be one, uh, two, one, two, one, it's the upper left. So two ones, a little bit more chromatic, right? It's a little bit more, what do the patients say? It's a little yellow, right? They don't like the way that it looks. Um, this has been prior endo treated. And, you know, so we've done, we've done an in-office whitening, but sometimes it's just not, sometimes it's just not enough, right? And so in cases like Jane's, I will refer them to the endodontist. Now in my office, I don't do endo. I don't like endo. If I, if I liked it, I would have gotten into endodontics. If I liked it, if I liked oral surgery, if I liked perio, if I liked seeing kids, I would have been, you know, a comprehensive dentist. But the truth is, and those of you that know me, I, I make no bones about it. I'm terrible <laughs> at everything but pros. Like I should never, I should never use an endophile. I should never try to take a tooth out. I'm not good at those things. Right? I'm the Prost Panda. I'm good at one thing. I do one thing. I do crown and bridge, dentures, and that's it. Um, I don't have any business doing anything else. Um, but bleaching falls in those categories, and bleaching falls in the category for all specialties, which we're going to kind of go through here. So this is, you know, bleaching for um, for the endodontist, right? So you take a look at Jane's initial situation here. Um, and her upper right central, you know, she's like a 1M2, maybe slightly darker than that. But the upper left, I mean, it's like way down, way down the scale, right? I mean, it's very, very dark. Um, so after she does um, her internal bleaching, um, 
the tooth actually came out much brighter. So if you look at the upper left central, it's actually a little bit brighter than the right now. So now we've kind of gone from too dark to too bright. And those of you that have done whitening in your office, those of you who have ever done, you know, a denture for somebody where the, the tooth shade or a flipper or something, patients generally do not complain about <laughs> tooth being too white, right? They usually won't complain that it's too white. They'll usually tell you, you know, they're usually there because it's too dark. So guess what? Guess what this patient wants to do now? She wants to do another in-office whitening treatment, right? So this kind of stuff is great. This is great for marketing. This wasn't the intention. My endodontist and I, you know, we weren't like twiddling our mustache behind the scenes saying, how can we, how can we get more money from this patient, right? How can we, you know, make them come back to see us? But that is part of the process. And we're going to get to, you know, we're going to talk about this later on about bleaching, begetting more bleaching, right? And it's a super easy procedure to do. Um, and again, you can make a lot of money for it. And the, the types of people that are doing the in-office whitening to start are going to be the kinds of people that keep coming back again and again and again. All right. So that's just a little taste of what we can do. You know, that's kind of like bread and butter. That's like everyday stuff. I get a patient coming in all the time, you know, that's got a tooth that's a little bit darker. So, you know, we're always starting with something that's a little bit more conservative in office before we start, you know, reopening the access to that. And if it doesn't work out, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't actually crunched the numbers. Maybe I'm maybe like at 50, 50, 50% 50 of the time, the patient doesn't need to go get internal uh, bleaching. They don't need to do the walking bleach, right? But half the time they do. Um, and I'm going to get into some cases now, some more kind of advanced cases. Uh, we got three different cases here where we've actually used the walking bleach technique. Um, and some of you might have seen me lecture on this before. You may have seen this. Um, but these are cases that I get like all the time, you know, and I've kind of set myself up as being, um, you know, sort of like a, a subject matter expert on the single central. You know, I really pride myself on my single central. It also helps that I have really great ceramics behind the scenes doing that, right? Doesn't matter how good my prep is, doesn't matter how good my treatment planning is. If my ceramics doesn't deliver, um, then I'm kind of dead in the water, right? So we see this all the time where these patients have a dark stump underneath, right? The, the tooth structure underneath their existing crown is really, really dark. The patient on the left, case number two, this patient has had prior endo before. The patient on the right has not. He's sustained trauma to that tooth. Maybe he's got some hemosiderin in there. He's got some of those heme, heme agents that are making the, um, the dentin really dark, but he hasn't had a root canal um, to date yet. And so big surprise, you know, what these teeth look like when we cut these off, right? When we section the existing restorations, <laughs> like we know what it's going to look like underneath. And the existing, the, the current dentist that these two patients had didn't have the forethought or didn't know about it, or maybe thought it'd be too expensive. They didn't do the internal bleaching ahead of time. And even, you know, the, the crown on the left, that's really bad, obviously, right? But the patient actually didn't mind it, right? The patient actually didn't mind, um, you know, the upper right central that you see on the left-hand side. On the right, yeah, that's actually not that bad. I mean, the ceramics weren't that bad. You know what I mean? If we're being honest, it's, I've seen much worse. You know, I've probably delivered worse than that in my, in my tenure. I've put crowns on that were not quite that nice. Um, but the truth is, you know, we got to get this, we got to treat this because my ceramist is going to throw a fit because no matter what the material is, whether you're using high opacity lithium disilicate or you're using, you know, some of the translucent zirconias, you know, you're just not going to block this color out because that color goes all the way through the root. So you, even if you drop the margin down and, you know, you kind of reduce the tooth and you make it thicker, you're still going to see a little shadow underneath. Like you will, it just always happens. So this procedure, um, you know, we, we call it the walking bleach technique. And why we call it the walking bleach technique? It's because the endodontist is placing that bleach inside the pulp chamber and the patient walks away, right? They walk out of the office with it and they usually come back at like a one week follow-up to see how they're doing. And sometimes this takes multiple applications. Um, so my endodontist and I, we, uh, we wrote this paper for Inside uh, Dentistry. This is a few years back now. This is like, right? right when like the pandemic hit called Inside the Tooth, Outside the Box. So if you guys want this, if you don't have a subscription to Inside Dentistry, um, let me know, I'll send you the PDF, um, but you can check this out, read more about this. This goes, does like a deep dive into what I'm gonna talk about here. So for both of these patients, the patient on the left, he just had to um, reaccess the canal that had already been endotreated. 
you know, and you can do anything. It doesn't have to be um, the pole of bleach that we're using. One of the more common um, medicaments is superoxal or sodium perborate, right? Um, so that's a real common thing to put in there. And the patient on the right, he um, he just he had to perform the, the root canal um, at that time. The patient knew this. That was the more expensive part. Um, but my endodontist is typically charging only about 75 bucks to do this. So that's why I, there's no way I'm going to do this procedure because I can't make that kind of, you know, I, 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 number one, I don't like being in a pulp chamber. I'm just not comfortable with it. So if we have general dentists out there, you know, people that are comfortable doing this, you should totally be doing this in your office. I think, I think my ceramist would pay for the procedure to get done just so he doesn't have to spend all that time trying to, you know, block out that color and mask that color. So when you see this, this is after one week. So this is one week of internal bleaching. And if you just saw this image on the right without any context, right, what would you think that was? It looks like a zirconia button, right? It is that white. And so we've actually, we've actually gone so far to the other way that we actually have to mask this out now. So that becomes sort of a, another issue to mask that out. And I don't have the, the time or the scope to go into how we actually mask this out, but there is a way to do that. I think I talk about it in the paper a little bit. Um, but you can you can mask that color. But this is a good problem to have that it's too white. Again, that's an easy problem for a ceramist to mask out. Um, it's not that it's not as nearly as difficult as having to mask out a stump that's you know charcoal gray or you know something that looks like candy corn, right? So here's the final result. And I you know this image from the side, I love this. You know having the, the lips kind of pulled back. There's no gray at the neck, and that's the thing that you always see. And patients will always tell you this. They're like, oh, I see it in photos from the side and from the angle, I, I noticed that it always looks a little bit gray, right? So you can see here, it's not gray at all. It looks really, really great. Um, patient was very, very happy with that. You know, and again, there's always critiques that can be made about the actual crown itself here. Um, I thought it's okay. It's, it's not hundred percent. There's always some things we would change. Um, but again, that's, we're not here to talk about, you know, ceramic, to go it's super in depth with ceramic while bleaching is our topic. Um, so similar, again, similar situation um, with this patient, right? Here's the pre-bleach shade after one week. Um, with At one week, we stopped for both of these, both of these patients, we stopped at the one week um, and we were doing okay. Now you take a look at this and somebody, you know, mentioned this when they saw this, they're like, hey, you know, it doesn't look white all the way to the incisal edge. That's intentional. I don't want this tooth to look pure white like that last case, right? This patient has some really nice color in the body in the incisal third of his tooth. So a really good ceramist is going to use those colors to his advantage, right? You want to keep some of that color there. That's not always a bad thing, right? And so when you take a look at the final result here again, you know, the lips retracted, looks pretty good at the neck. There's no graying out. Um, patient was really happy. And again, when we show um, the up close here, this is lithium. Both of these crowns were lithium disilicate. They weren't weren't zirconia. We didn't use zirconia for these. These are bonded restorations. Um, you know, it looks pretty good. Again, you know, looking at this with my ceramist, there's always a few things that we would have changed, always a few things we might have done differently. But, you know, the patient was really, really happy with it. You guys are looking at that crown, you know, blown up on a screen. You know exactly what you're looking at. In dynamic movement and everyday conversation, you'd never, you'd never be able to tell that that was a crown, right? And so one of the things um, that I always recommend, we're gonna talk about marketing later on, but you guys should write papers. You guys should really put this out there, submit these articles. As somebody who is a former editor in chief for a journal, um, you know, we're always struggling to get good content. Um, and you know, when this paper, when this patient walks in, you know, he was so psyched to see this, he sees his, his tooth in this magazine. He's like, you know, he's a he's a school librarian. So he's like, hey man, I'm gonna be like Facebook famous, which you know, being Facebook famous is like being rich in Monopoly doesn't, <laughs> doesn't mean a lot. But this, you know, when this goes on the internet, all the web crawlers see my name, they see my practice name, and they start sending patients to my website. This is why we don't really do any advertising for our website. You write a paper about any topic, it doesn't have to be bleaching, anything, and the web crawlers recognize that, and they'll start directing traffic back to your website without you having to do Google AdWords and all that kind of stuff and spending your budget on that. Um, last case that we'll do for the, the internal bleaching here, um, just want to give you guys a nice taste of, you know, some of the stuff that we're, um, kind of doing every day in our office. Um, this is case study number four for walking bleach. And again, it's a couple full coverage crowns. 
Um, this is this is my buddy Chris. Um, you know, when patients walk in like this again, from the last two cases I showed you, those are really difficult cases because it's a single. When you're dealing with two centrals, it's a little bit easier to manage, but it's no less difficult trying to mask the color um, when when the patient's teeth. And again, you guys can see what this is going to look like underneath, right? It's, it's no surprise. Um, what Chris has hiding underneath here, right? And the thing that I love about these cases where patients have had prior root canals, um, you know, I, I can go easy on the anesthesia. They're not going to feel anything when I'm cutting the teeth off. Um, but also with Chris's case here, man, you know, Chris is a, he's a lobsterman, you know, he's been walking around with these metal ceramic crowns for 20 plus years, right? Without any issue. It's his wife that <clears throat> gives him the nudge because she's tired of looking at him at the breakfast table, right? She wants him to come in and see me to get this work done. Um, you know, I can put a hockey puck in his mouth and it'd look better than what he has, right? But still, I got I to stack the deck for my, for my ceramist and I got to, you know, have these, have these uh, done internally. So I've kind of gone through the process with you guys a little bit. You know, so we cut these off, you know, tooth number eight, you know, the upper right central, maybe I could get away with it. I don't know. It's not quite as bad as the upper left. And Chris has had blunt force trauma to these, you know, he was a younger, younger, younger man, 20, 25 years ago. Again, that hemocytorin, all those uh, ferric agents from, from the blood just leak into the dentin and cause this to look just gnarly. You know what I mean? Um, and you guys, this is the stuff that you see every single day. So um, you know, we decided that we're going to do some core buildups. The photo on the left is actually, uh, an image done, you know, that is after the image on the right. I was just showing this because we use a lot of polarized images, um, when we're doing this for the ceramist. Um, again, this is the result after, um, doing the walking bleach for about a week or so. Um, and you can see, I've done a little core, slight core buildup here just to kind of even, even these, uh, teeth out to create smoother line angles. Again, we're doing um you know all ceramic restorations um and with this case um we are doing zirconia um but we still do our stump shades and the color of this still matters with zirconia because a lot of companies today produce uh like a high very high translucent zirconia and it will show through you'll see this in your cases right like when we when we see this on the model you can see, even though this is a zirconia core, you can see the stone showing through. So this is why it's absolutely critical. I, and I hear this all the time at lectures. Well, I'll just do zirconia. I'll block it out. No, you won't. It won't block out. And trust me, as somebody who's a specialist, I, I have to put out most of the fires, you know, from dentists in neighboring towns. And it's other prosthodontists too, who thought like, oh, I'll just use zirconia. It's general dentists. It's other, you know, it's other restorative dentists. Like, I see this every single day where they thought they'd mask it just by using Zerk and it doesn't work because at the neck of that tooth, especially in patients that have high smile lines, you will see it hundred percent, right? So most of the ceramic layering that's being done is being done sort of in the middle and in the incisal edge. That's like the, the party end of the tooth, right? The, the business end is right at the neck, right there where you see that where it's still white. Ceramus usually isn't adding a lot of zirconia, isn't adding a lot of um, porcelain to that area when they're layering this. So you really got to make sure that the color is just right. And so actually what they're doing is just adding a little bit of glaze there, maybe a little bit of staining, but that's it. And that's definitely not going to block out. It's not going to block out that dark stump, right? So here we are. Here's the initial situation for Chris. Um, here's the final. Looks pretty good. He was happy. This is the day of delivery. Um, you know, and one of the questions that I get all the time from people is, um, you know, when the patient comes in like this, you deliver it, is there any rebound? Yeah, there can totally be rebound, you know, like knock on wood. I haven't had a lot in my, my personal, you know, private practice yet, but again, I haven't been doing this for, you know, a quarter century yet. And, you know, while we're speaking about a quarter century, the peer reviewed literature shows that, you know, after 25 years with walking bleach, there's about an 85% success rate, right? Where these patients think that it still looks good. Um, the clinical judgment of the practitioner of the dentist thinks that it still looks really nice. Um, so, you know, you do this, you know, and the, the running joke with all dentists who have been doing this long enough is, you know, everything that we do, if you, if the patient lives, <laughs> yeah, lives long enough, everything that we do will have to be replaced at some point. Right. So, and it, it's just a numbers game. If you do enough of these, yeah, you're going to 
have to redo some of them. But I'll take, you know, even at, still, I'll take five years of that tooth looking really great versus, you know, bonding that restoration or cementing that restoration. And then like a week later, the patient, you know, is back in my office because the, the neck of that thing looks great. So it can last and it will last a long time. So don't let that, you know, dissuade you from, from doing um, the internal bleaching, you know, because the, the alternative to that, it's, it's not great. Um, so here was, this is a case that I put in here because, <laughs> you know, and I started showing, I guess, some of my like failures whenever I, whenever I lecture, I start including more of my, the stuff from Cone's closet, you know, some of the skeletons that are in my closet. And I do a ton of bleaching. And again, it's a numbers game. If you do enough of this, you're going to get patients in your office where, man, the final result just doesn't look, it just doesn't look outstanding, right? So um, this is Carrie. Uh, she's a 62-year-old female. Um, you know, this is kind of like my avatar. This is like the bulk of the patients that come into my office are, are just like Carrie, right? And, um, you know, women who are, you know, maybe just past middle age, um, and they've got like a wedding coming up or something. And so Carrie, you know, has an existing metal ceramic crown on her upper left um, central, right? And it, it was not good. She's had it forever, but now her son is getting married soon. She wants to do something for herself. You know, her kids are out. She's an empty nester. She wants to do something really nice for herself. So she comes in and we do this internal bleaching for her. And man, like, I, oh, sorry, not internal bleaching. I, I misspoke. I've got internal walking bleach on the brain. We do an in-office bleaching for Carrie. And if you take a look, I mean, this is after a half hour of really potent 38% hydrogen peroxide, right? This is, uh, this is SDI's polar rapid that we used here. After a half hour, that's what it looks like. So she started at, you know, maybe like a three R1.5. And if you look at, you know, here down the, down the chain, 3M1 is like two shades difference. And so if I look after the 30 minutes and I put the 3M1 shade guide up there, you know, maybe if I use my imagination, maybe, maybe she's there, maybe she got one or two shades. That's not great, man. Like in good conscience, I can't take this patient's money for that, you know, because I think that that 3M1 is actually a little bit brighter than where she actually is. I think maybe she, maybe she got a half shade brighter, maybe. And you're going to find that, you know, five-ish percent of your patients are going to have almost no response to in-office bleaching. It, again, it just, it just happens. Um, but don't get discouraged um, because there is a solution. So what do you do for this? Um, when this happens, and it, it happens enough if you're doing, you know, 10 or 12 of these like a week, I will offer the patients the opportunity to do take-home trays. And I'll make them the trays at no charge because they just paid a ton you know, 600 bucks or so for my in-office bleaching, uh, you know, 450 bucks, 500 is about the average. We charge 600. I have to, because I'm a specialist. I have to make that much an hour to be profitable. So I'll, I'll make her trays, uh, take home trays, um, you know, and she actually thought, and it's funny because I, I did the results that you just saw, she looks in the mirror, she's like, oh, it looks great. And I'm like, no, it's not. You know what I mean? It's not great. I have to, I have a conscience. I got to sleep at night. <laughs> So I tell her, Carrie, I want to get your teeth really bright. We can do this. I'm going to make you take home trays. I'm going to give you a 10% carbamide peroxide and you can use it every night. You're going to sleep with it every night, eight hours through the night, you know, and you're going to do this for two weeks. And I want to see you back here in two weeks after we make these trays. So at that same appointment, I made her trays, quick upper, lower alginate impressions. She comes back in two weeks. Now she's a 1M1 and that's about 10 shades brighter. So she got about 10 shades brighter and now we're rocking and rolling. So even these really refractory teeth that will have very difficulty, you know, have a difficult time bleaching in office, um, give them the 10% carbamide peroxide. And just out of virtue of the fact that that carbamide peroxide is going to be in contact for so long um, with those teeth, it's going to get them really bright. So now she sees the difference. When I show her these before and after photos, she's like, wow, that looks really, really nice. And now that she's in the office, I say, hey, since you're such a good sport, I'm going to do another in-office bleaching for you because I want to have your teeth be super impactful, you know, be, when we get ready to cut this crown off and, uh, you know, get you ready for your son's wedding. So, again, the in-office, you know, once you're down to that level, once you're in like the one region, you know, this is like something like an A1 region. Now it starts getting difficult to move the needle a little bit more. Um, so we had her at a 1M2. So after the in-office bleaching again, another 30 minutes, she gets down to a 1M1. 
And so after this, after she kind of relaxes and goes home, you know, she might start moving into that OM3 range, which is like the true bleach, right? And that's really where we want to get her. Um, but she's really happy with this. Um, super grateful. She can see now um, the different cause. So when you look at where she started, you know, day one, you know, at that 3R1.5 to now, it's a huge change. It's really dramatic. So trays are great. And I know not everybody wants to use the trays um you know and so for many of my patients we will do in office bleaching and I, something i will tell you if you are doing in office constantly and you're finding like hey the results just don't look that great something you might need to do um is make sure that you take your bleach out of the refrigerator right make sure that you take it out of the refrigerator for at least an hour and let that um that 38 bleach um warm up or if you're hearing this now you're like wait we need to refrigerate the bleach yeah, you definitely need to refrigerate your bleach, all right? So especially the, the hardcore hydrogen peroxide, the higher grade hydrogen peroxide, it's unstable. So if you don't put it in the refrigerator, it breaks down. So maybe you've had a bunch of bleach, you know, sitting around in the shelf for a while and it's inactive, right? So just read the instructions, um, what we call the IFU, right? The instructions for use. And I'm so guilty of this. Oftentimes I don't do this. And I know for a while when we first opened our practice, like many years ago, like <laughs> I didn't have my stuff in the refrigerator and not all bleach needs to be refrigerated, right? So the Polar Rapid, which is like a 38% hydrogen peroxide. If you look on there, yeah, keep refrigerated. Some of the other stuff that's, um, you know, a little bit uh, has more of the carbamide peroxide. You don't need to refrigerate that, right? Because it's more stable. You can leave it out. So you, make sure you tell your patients too. Most of the time they're taking home carbamide peroxide gel, so they don't need to put it in the refrigerator at all. Um, and then this is what I was saying before too. When you're doing the in-office, take it, take it out for an hour. Let it sit out for an hour um, beforehand. Um, and you'll have, I think you'll have much, I think, think you'll find that you have much better results. And then one of the other things um, that people tell me all the time is, um, you know, that they're not cleaning the teeth. Like, man, you definitely got to clean the teeth ahead of time, but make sure that you don't clean them with a fluoridated pumice, right? You just, there's, you can just use Henry Shine. There's a bunch of companies that make these. Um, one of the things that I have on hand is this Concepsis, right? This chlorhexidine scrub. I use this all the time, um, you know, right before I bond a crown, you know, when we're doing our veneers or our all ceramic crowns. I use this all the time on the patients um, to clean their teeth off ahead of time. So you can use anything that you want. Um, like I said, there's a lot of companies that make a, a not like Whitmix, I think makes a non-fluoridated pumice. It's really soft. Um, just make sure that you're not using it because the fluoride is going to kind of prevent the, the bleach from <laughs> having the effect. Um, and you got to do that right before you do it. So if the patients come in, I'll give them what we call an express wash with Cavitron um, and, I'll, and I'll pumice their teeth really quick. All right, so here's, you guys know, I like talking about dogma, things that are sort of, they've been put out there that we don't really follow anymore, right? And this is one of them. So remember in dental school, when we, when, you know, while we're on the topic of making custom trays, you guys remember adding these reservoirs, right? And you take like that little gel, and this is the same gel that you use to cover up the gingiva so that the patients don't get burned with the bleach in office, right? So true, false, what do you guys think? Uh, these reservoirs, they have greater efficiency when we're doing uh, take home, take home custom trays. If I'm showing it, you probably know that this is false, right? So, but it's, and not only is it false, but there is a biological component to this. So putting reservoirs in your bleaching trays, they've shown, they've done multiple studies on this, but they've shown that it actually causes gingival inflammation. So don't do that. Number one, it's time consuming and time is money and it causes gingival inflammation. So uh, don't do that anymore. Um, something else I wanna show you guys too. Um, shade guides. Now this is kind of, I call this like a little hot tip, right? So the shade guide that I use primarily, now you saw before I was using the Vita 3D, um, that was a case that I, you know, I'd done a while back. What I'm doing a lot of times now is I'm using another Vita shade guide that's sort of a modified version of that 3D shade guide. Um, and so this is what this is, and it's a it's a Vita bleaching guide. Um, and something that they have on here that they don't have on the, the Vita 3D or other shade guides is they have these BGUs or like these bleaching guide units, right? And um, this has actually been shown in the literature now that the ADA supports this. I think it's the only shade guide that the ADA supports uh, and endorses for, for whitening. And the nice thing about 
these BGUs or these bleaching guide units. So if you look at the top of the shade guide here, it goes from one and then it goes all the way to 29. So in this photograph, you see one through 21, right? Your patients, and maybe even you, you're not going to remember that that patient was like a 1.5 M2 or a 3 M2. Like that doesn't mean anything to your patients, right? But when I do this patient here, so you see the pre-bleach situation on the left and I say, okay, this patient is an 11, right? So out of 29, they're an 11. So they're kind of like somewhere almost in the middle, but towards the, the, the whiter end, right? With one being the brightest and 29 being like the darkest or the most chromatic. You tell that patient that they're an 11, right? And all that patient knows in their mind is they want to get to number one. You've given them a target. You've given them a goalpost, a finish line. This has made me more money in my practice, this shade guide, than anything else I can think of for, for bleaching. Patients want to get to number one. They want to be number one, and that's all that they know, right? So I write down in the chart that they were 1.5, M2, whatever, to start with. But the patient knows, okay, I started the day at an 11. After my first in-office bleaching, I'm down to a five now. Okay, cool. Well, I want to come back because I want to get to one. I'm telling you, patients get excited about that. You've given them a goal to shoot for, and they will keep coming back over and over again. So definitely check out this shade guide from Vita. It's just their bleaching guide. Um, and if you guys want the study that was written about this, this was done by uh, Raid um, Paravina. I'll send this uh, study to you guys as well. Actually, there's a few different ones, um, but it's actually a fantastic, um, again, fantastic marketing, <laughs> which we're going to talk about um, in a little bit as well. So let me go on. This is another case study. This is one of my favorite cases. I did this is from Melissa, um, 22, 29 year old female. She comes in and she, again, has a big event coming up. She, you know, she's beyond the age now, beyond her college years. She wants to start doing something for herself. She's moving into, you know, her job space where she wants to like look nice, you know. Um, and what we decided to do for her is, you know, we are going to restore her teeth. And again, it, do it doesn't take a board certified prosthodontist to look at this and be like, oh man, this girl needs some, some work done here. So teeth seven, eight, nine, and 10, all of the the incisors and the maxilla have all had root canals. Tooth number 10 hasn't had restoration, uh, full coverage restoration. It's got some direct composite, but there's like uh, this composite here wraps all the way around. And by the time we're done removing all the decay, you know, two thirds of this crown, this tooth is gone. Um, so we decided that we were going to do full coverage crowns um, on Melissa. And again, you know, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but when you look at this, like, you know what it's going to look like underneath, right? This is going to look absolutely terrible. And so we go ahead and we cut off all the crowns and yeah, there's like little nubby pegs and a bunch of old cements and a bunch of recurrent decay, right? It, it's not pretty. And so for these patients, anytime somebody comes in and they decide that they're going to replace their anterior teeth, we always offer them bleaching. This is a great adjunct. I know some people don't really you know, are kind of confused about like, how do I introduce bleaching to my patients? Anytime somebody's getting an anterior restoration, whether it's indirect, like a ceramic, you know, whether it's veneer or crown, or whether it's direct, like composite, offer them bleaching, you know, and make sure not, you don't need to fear monger with your patients, but just let them know like, hey, patient education, right? And I think there's a big difference between fear mongering and patient education. You just say, hey, this is not gonna, you know, your teeth, once we once we put these restorations in, they they won't bleach out. You know what I mean. And oftentimes, with a patient like this, it's spending upwards of ten thousand dollars. You know, just from my end to do the crowns. We'll usually we don't throw it in for free. I mean, I still gotta like keep the lights on, but we'll do. Um, you know, we'll give them a discount. You know, and we'll say, hey, listen, we're gonna start with an in-office bleaching to kind of get you get you on board. Um, we're gonna make you some trays. And those of you that watched my um, my webinar last time know that. I'm a big fan of making custom trays for patients who have poor hygiene, but there's also a good reason to make trays, um, you know, when the patients are in temps, when they, after they've got their final restorations, using that 10% carbamide peroxide, again, it's just going to clean around all of the crowns, all the restorations, and it's just going to make sure um, to kind of preserve and uh, secure the investment long-term. It's just cheap, you know, cheap insurance for them. So here's the way that Melissa started. This is the way that she looked after. Um, again, you can see Canines are always the most difficult to bleach, uh, but you look here, you know, you see how her canines look to start, look how, look how they look afterwards. I mean, her canines in this photo are probably brighter than my 
anterior teeth. I mean, these got really, really insanely bright. Um, a lot of times patients don't want to pay for the trays afterwards. Um, you know, and so people ask me like, all right, well, what if my patient, you know, I already made them trays. They're so much money into the hole. Like, what can I do for them? Um, so that they can bleach, you know, cause obviously these front teeth aren't going to bleach. If the patient doesn't buy into that for the hygiene aspect, there's other things that you can do. And one of the things that we really, really like is, um, this, uh, we'll call this like bleach. I call it like a bleaching pen. Um, SCI calls it polo luminate. It's like a little, it's like the size of like a lipstick or something like that. And you can keep it in your purse. I've got one in like my backpack and in my like down vest, I keep it in like that little stove pocket. And so what you can do with this is you can like pull, pull this out and you can just paint it on the teeth. You kind of just pull the lips back, dry them off a little bit, paint it on the teeth. It's a 6% hydrogen peroxide. It's pretty potent stuff. And you just wear it around. So you don't need to have trays. And this costs like, you know, next to nothing. And patients really, really go for this um, because it, it's really pretty inexpensive. So we pay typically in our office, maybe like 10 bucks for this, but we sell it for like 20 bucks. And I'll tell you what, you know, here's the hot tip. Put this out on your front desk. When patients are checking out, I can't, we, it is difficult for us to keep these in stock, especially around the holidays, um, you know, Christmas time, um, New Year, um, Valentine's. People buy these for their significant other. They buy them for themselves. And they'll take two or three of these. They'll buy three of these. If they don't go for like, you know, the bleaching trays, at, you know, two, 200 bucks, a piece, they'll, they'll definitely take two or three of these and they'll keep coming back for these and it's easy to use. So um, definitely check those out. Um, you know, and Melissa, she uses these as well. So, you know, and she's like, I, I you know, I just don't really like where some people just don't like wearing the trays. And so she'll use these on her canines and her premolars when she's walking around. And so there's, um, there's the final result with this. And I was so glad that she decided to bleach her teeth. Um, you know, to use the trays in the beginning, to get the canines and the premolars, like really, really bright. because we were able to do something really, really nice for her um, in the end. Um, this is the part that I, I really like talking about, and it's the, the marketing aspect of bleaching. Um, you know, I know everybody, this is sort of cliche that people say that, you know, bleaching is a great adjunct um, to, to other procedures. And so what do you guys think? You know, have you found this in your practice? Do you think that tooth whitening opens the door to additional cosmetic procedures, right? Like, is it the gateway you know, medical procedure that you can do, dental procedure, like you do bleaching and then people will want to start doing this. What do you guys think, true or false? You know, and maybe it's just even anecdotal, you know, in our office anyway, it's true, but there's an asterisk, there's an asterisk on this. So it, it is true that people who are bleaching tend to do other procedures, but I don't want you guys to think about it like that. I don't want you guys to think about like, oh, well, I'm going to try to introduce bleaching so that I can do more veneers or so that that patient will finally get those implants, you know, take that bridge off and do those implants. I want you guys to think about it in terms of the fact that bleaching leads to more bleaching. Again, the types of people who are coming in to get whitening will keep coming back. Most of our patients that get their teeth whitened in office are repeat offenders. Like I, you know, we get a ton of new patients, but I know that those patients are going to come back you know, within like six months to a year. And they always ask me, it doesn't matter. I'm pretty honest with them. I'll tell them like, you know, even with like red wine and coffee and all that stuff, I'm like, you probably go two years, 18 months to two years before you need to do it again. And they keep coming back every time they get their cleaning. They're like, hey, can I just do a quick session? You know, I'm like, yeah, no problem, man. It's a lot of money. It's your money, but they want to spend it. You know, a lot of these people are spending that kind of money on, on their hair. You know, they'll spend like $200 on a haircut you know, or they'll spend like, you know, some of these guys that I have, um, they're these like uh, local athletes, like the hockey players, they'll spend, you know, 150 bucks on a massage, you know, they'll spend that kind of money to get their teeth whitened. Um, so let me just show you guys, this is something that I think is really kind of exciting. And I've shown this before. It's a little outdated. It's back in 2020. I got to update it now, but it's still the same. Um, because I've made my own website, I have access to all the back end details. And when you look at the, the content that's on my website, when I look at what people are, are looking at in my website, and you look at this, I have a lot, large percentage of people going to the bleaching page. Um, you know, if you look at where veneers are, I have more people looking at bleaching than I do veneers. So I know people are like, oh, veneers are the money makers. No, they're not. Veneers are cost a ton of money. The, pa the patients pop them off. They come back over and over to get them done. Like it's, you know, the temps, they, they pop the temps off, off over and over. Veneers are tough to do, right? Um, and 
if I do my veneer right, take a look at my implants. My implants are low. If I do that implant right, I'm not redoing that veneer for 25 years. You know, I'll probably never redo that implant. Like, you know, so the, the whitening is, is big money. And that's why I was talking about that ROI in the beginning. The ROI is huge. You gotta be doing, you gotta be doing whitening your office. If you care about making money, you should. And so I want you guys to consider this, okay? Um, this is shocking for most people when they really see the numbers. Um, so you could set up your practice to be a whitening practice only. In my office, it's just me. I'm the only doctor there. Um, I do all my own hygiene. I do all my own bleaching. I don't have an assistant doing any of this stuff, right? I don't have any staff members aside from my wife, who's the office manager. That's it. So if you had a, a practice where you could scale this, where you actually had an associate or you have your hygienist or you have your assistant doing this, this is how what you could do. Without ever having to cut a tooth or give anesthesia, you could see four patients a day and only work four days a week and you would make a ton of money. And this is how. So you're going to see four patients a day. You're going to see two patients in the morning, two in the afternoon, or whatever it is. And you're going to see them for an hour each, right? So that patient comes in to do an in-office whitening. So if you're marketing this and advertising yourself as like a, a whitening dentist, you get a patient to come in for an hour to do an in-office whitening. That in-office whitening takes like 30 minutes, okay? But they, they walk in, you're going to make a quick alginate upper lower impression, or you're going to scan them or whatever it is. And then when they are sit, sit down in the chair, right? You have your assistant, you have your hygienist, whoever it is, start doing that in-office whitening. In our office, we charge 600 bucks, okay? Meanwhile, you've got another one of your staff members or you running back into the laboratory, pouring that alginate impression that you made, you pour it in Snapstone. Now you do a suck down over that. You make them a custom tray and that takes maybe 30 minutes to do. It's really, really quick. So within an hour, you charge them 600 bucks for the in-office uh, whitening you charge them 400 bucks for their trays, 200 per arch as they walk out the door. That's a thousand bucks an hour that you can make. So in four hours in your office, you can make $4,000. If you're working four days a week, say Monday through Thursday, working only four hour days, you could make $16,000 a week. That's a ton of money. And you've never had to cut a tooth. You've got no liability. Um, and now let's say you want to take off a month a year. Like every year, you're just taking off a month, right? So that's 48 weeks times $16,000 a week you can make well over three quarters of a million dollars just bleaching. I live in Portland, Maine. It's a smaller city. We don't have the numbers. Plus, I don't have the staff to do this. I would love to see somebody do this because in our office, we make Boku bucks bleaching. This is why I don't have to see that many patients. I don't have to prep, you know, 10 teeth a day to do this. I can do only the procedures I want. And I can say no to all the other crap, right? And you don't need, I don't have any staff. I have almost no overhead from the bleaching, no lab fees, right? And no liability. And best of all, I, again, if I haven't beat this into you guys enough, it's repeatable. The patients are immediately happy and you just get to do it over and over and over, right? So it's really, it's a great thing to do. You guys really should look into bleaching if you're not doing it. Um, and also, and I don't know that any other company does this, um, definitely, again, I know I do speak for SDI, um, but this is one thing about them. You know, I was using their products long before I discovered this, but you can get put on their website as a, a Pola trained dentist. And again, this is free advertising for you guys. They put you on their website. And when somebody goes in to look for like, oh, I want to look for a Pola dentist in, in my area, right? Somebody who's doing, you know, Pola, Pola bleaching, they type in the area code and you check this out. This is when you put this on their website. Oh, my office comes up, Dr. Miles Cohen at Nuance Dental Specialist. Okay. There's a link there. The patient clicks on that link and it brings them right up to my webpage. Okay. And then as soon as they hover on my webpage for about two seconds, they get an ad like this for, you know, this is uh, Marina Gray. She was one of the Miss USA uh, pageant contestants that I worked with. And that's the other thing. Um, SDI has hooked me up with this kind of deal where we do, you know, many of the, the women in New England who are running for the Miss USA pageant. You want to talk about, you know, return on investment and good marketing. You, you take some photos with some of the Miss USA contestants and put that on your website, put that on Instagram and Facebook. Man, people see that, right? And so now this pops up and people are like, oh man, this is the guy that does the Miss USA contestants, right? And so now they book an appointment and this is free <laughs> advertising. Uh, it's just so easy. Like we don't pay for ads. Um, and something else to consider with a pandemic, and I would never wish a global pandemic or harm upon anybody, but 
this pandemic has created this Zoom culture, right? Hey, we're on a Zoom meeting now. It's like I've broken through that like fourth wall kind of thing, right? People are on these conference calls all day long. And as I'm looking at, you know, myself here, I'm like, yeah, my teeth could be a little whiter. You know, Barb, Barbara's sitting there or Jeffrey's sitting there looking at, you know, under these harsh fluorescent lights with all their buddies. And they're like, gosh, I got to do something about my ugly teeth, right? Half of the people that come into my office, I'm like, hey, what brought you in today? They're like, I hate the way my teeth look on Zoom meetings. <laughs> so I'm just telling you, we're in, we're in that world now. And when, when the pandemic hit and, you know, we weren't going in as much, people would come in because there wasn't an aerosol created from bleaching. And people were so ragged from, uh, you know, the, the pandemic too. Somebody, one of my friends said, you know, there are three types of people that emerged from the pandemic. There were the hunks, you know, the people that, you know, got the, the Peloton or the treadmill and got in shape. There were the hunks, the drunks, the people that were just drinking red wine all day. And, and the chunks, you know, the people that were, you know, eating, you know, highly refined carbohydrates. I think that was me a little bit, <laughs> right? And so these people want to do something for themselves. And, you know, many of these people weren't working, you know, and so they're like, I can't do all the veneers. You know, that's like, I don't have $20,000 to spend on a, on a smile makeover, but man, I'll whiten my teeth. That costs next to nothing and takes 30, 30, 40 minutes. Um, so, and here's the other thing while we're on the topic of marketing, um, when we see only adult patients in my office, but many of my adult patients have children and many of their children are getting braces or they go to a pediatric dentist, Right. So I'm going to try to capitalize on that as much as I can. So at my front desk, I keep Pola um, SDI now has these boxes that is um, bleaching, whitening for aligners, right? This is a great marketing strategy. So this is my daughter. She's a teenager. Teenagers don't always have the greatest hygiene in the world, right? We know this. Um, so what SDI has done, which is really, really smart, is now they've got this box that says Pola for aligners. So we put this at the front desk and my, you know, the mother that came in that got her veneers on eight and nine or, you know, the, the lobster man that got his, his crown back there on 30, you know, he sees this and he's like, hey, my, my son or my daughter who's, you know, 14, 15, 16, they have, they have an Invisalign, they've got in aligners. Um, this is safe for them. They can use this. And I'm like, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll have them come in. I don't just give them the bleach. I say, hey, have your have your son or daughter come in. I'll, I'll only charge them like 25 bucks for the, in, the, the professional consult. They come in. Now that I've made them a patient of record, I'll give them this uh, this whitening to take home to use in their, their trays. This is a great carrot for those teenagers to wear their trays. Because again, my daughter for the longest time wouldn't wear her trays. She'd leave them laying around the counter. It's super gross. Um, once I gave her this, she started wearing her trays religiously. Like she'd never take them out. Now her teeth are super bright and she loves it. So this is a really, really great marketing strategy, um, that you can use for, for teenagers in your office. If you're a practice that doesn't see a lot of, um, kids, you know, young folks, um, this is a great thing to do. So, and what I usually do like 99 out of hundred times, I'm giving them the 10% carbamide peroxide because it's so safe. Um, you know, I don't want these guys to burn themselves. And a lot of times kids, you know, they, and I know because I've got them, you tell them, you know, you give them the stronger whitening agent and you say, Hey, only wear this for 45 minutes once a day. And the first thing they think is like, Hey, if 45 minutes once a day for like two weeks, will get me this. They start doing the math. They're like, well, what if I just wore it for like 12 hours all at once? Dude, they're going to barbecue themselves and they're going to hurt themselves. So make this child <laughs> kid proof, right? Just give them the 10%. It's the best way to go. And I've already shown you what 10% will do to teeth on Carrie's teeth, those refractory patients where they don't bleach as much, right? So do that for them. Um, so, and you know, again, it's really good for their oral hygiene. You'll notice my daughter's got these little buttons here and we're gonna talk about that, those little resin buttons because people always wanna know, hey, will the bleach penetrate through that button? Um, so we'll get to that. And this is really beneficial if the bleach oozes out. The way I design my trays is I make the trays extend past, um, you know, the cervical area of the tooth because I actually want the bleach to get on their gums. It's gonna help keep them nice and clean, right? And it, do, it doesn't really burn that much. They're going to be fine. Um, and so again, you know, the dads, the moms, whoever that you're giving this to, they're going to say, hey, well, are my kids going to have dark spots, you know, underneath their teeth when their little buttons come off, when they're done with their, um, you know, aligners? And the I had to see this for myself and I tried it on my wife. My poor wife, she's a guinea pig. So you'll see here on her upper right lateral, um, we bonded a little resin to this tooth. 
Um, we did an in-office whitening, uh, you know, three eight-minute sessions with a 38% hydrogen peroxide. And afterwards, tooth was exactly the same color. And there's actually literature on this too. Um, I didn't have time to add it to this presentation today. Um, but if you guys want that, um, Van Hayward wrote a, wrote a study on this. He did a study on this too. Um, so it's really, it, it turns out that, yeah, it doesn't work. And I did this on my wife before I read that study. I probably should have done it the other way around because I would have been in the doghouse if that did leave a dark spot on her tooth. So um, yeah, it's, to it's totally safe um, using um, whitening gel for patients who are in aligners or if they have braces, um, it's totally safe and you should be doing it. Um, but not everyone has aligners, right? Some of these folks are still doing traditional ortho. So this is case number seven I'm gonna show you guys. Um, so we don't get a lot of these folks anymore, um, but we get them on occasion. So this is Ashton. Um, so Ashton comes in, she's got traditional, uh, she's got traditional braces, 24 year old female. She's been in braces now for, a, uh, I think four years actually. She was an orthognathic patient, but she didn't wanna do that. So they've spent, had spent a lot of time with her in her braces. Um, and you know what patients who have been in braces for a long time look like? Check this out. Look at that hygiene, right? This is just, I feel so bad. Uh, let me go back to that. Um, you know, you just look at the tissues, just hyperplastic. It's just oozing out. Great, great case for somebody like this. You know, they use, they use um, the whitening gel at home and it's going to clean them up so, so, so nicely. Um, and so, so what do you do? People are like, how do you do, how do you whiten their teeth? I'm not doing this in office, right? Most of the folks who are in braces are under the age of when I would do an in-office. A lot of them are, you know, like 15, 16. I'm not doing in-office on 15, 16 year olds, um, even though you can. It's not contraindicated. Uh, but what I use is the Pola Light. Um, so SDI has this thing. It's called a Pola Light. There's a lot of companies that make something similar to this. Um, it has a couple different uh, formulations to it. You can see here they have a 9.5% hydrogen peroxide or they have a 22% carbamide peroxide, which roughly translates to about a 7% hydrogen peroxide after it breaks down. For most of my patients, I'm giving them the carbamide peroxide, not the hydrogen peroxide. And again, I like the carbamide peroxide because one of the byproducts of that when it gets in the oral cavity is the urea component. And that urea makes the oral environment, um, the pH will be very, very high, right? And that, that high pH is gonna kill bacteria um, it's going to make it very inhospitable for, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the strep mutans and things like that. And it's going to just really, really clean up their tissue. Um, and again, patients are a little bit more compliant with that because it doesn't burn as much. Um, and so essentially what the patients do is they take this home, right? And they fill these trays. It's kind of generic. It doesn't need, it doesn't fit, have to, you know, there's nothing to get snagged on. It's just like thick rubber. So the patients will get their, it comes with the bleach already in there and they'll just inject it right into the tray. Um, and then they just, you know, turn this little light on, they put it in their mouth and I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, the, the value of this light is, is debatable. I think we talked about that last time. There's studies that show that the led aids in the whitening process kind of accelerates it, but every paper that I find that says that it helps, I can find one that says that it doesn't do anything. There's nothing that says that it does any harm. Um, but you know, it gives the patient something to do. I'll, uh, even if there's no actual value to it, even if it's kind of smoke and mirrors, to be honest, patients love it. They think it's really, really cool. Um, this pole light comes with a little charger that you can charge it, but actually it's just the delivery system of having these trays that fit over the braces, which is the, is the real uh, kicker to this. So if you do have patients that are wearing braces, this is, a, this is a great alternative to actually making trays. We sell these in our office. I think we sell them for like 150, 175 bucks and they retail for like 90 bucks. So again, you know, they make some money off of it. And long after they're done, if the patients don't want to come in, you know, for the in-office, they, they've got like a tray that they can use at home. And the patients like this because, um, again, if they've ever used, if you've ever had patients use white strips, the thing they'll tell you all the time is it hurt, right? It hurts. So, all right. So, uh, you guys, I appreciate you sticking around. We're going to go into one last case. This is actually, this is today. This is a patient that came in today. So I, I added this last minute on the car ride home. I'm like adding a few slides. I really want to show this to you guys. Um, and this is something that we can use uh, whitening for the oral surgeon, the periodontist. Um, so again, every specialty can do whitening. So this is Mark, super nice guy. Mark's a great guy, 51 year old male. Um, and what we did for Mark is we had to make him an immediate denture. When you take a look at his teeth here and we did just a maxillary immediate denture to start. 
Many of these teeth were kind of rotted out, bombed out. He's got abscesses. He's missing a bunch of teeth. Um, and he knew he was going to lose his teeth. And so this is surgery that actually happened today. Um, so the periodontist took all of the teeth out. Um, and so how can we use bleaching for this guy? Like he doesn't have any teeth on the top. What are we going to do? Well, if you saw my denture last time, you'll know that for my patients that have implants and locators, we will put bleach around them. Um, at 10% carbon peroxide, they'll wear that, you know, once or twice a night for eight hours. And it really, really cleans up around um, the implant. So for these patients that have had these immediate extractions taken out, you can see here's his denture. Um, we just inject a bead of this around and right before he leaves, that goes in. And that 10% carbon peroxide, he's not, he's not taking this denture out for at least 24 hours. That bleach is going to deactivate it for about eight hours. So it's not going to harm him. It's not going to do anything. And that bleach is just going to fill into all of those little um, areas, you know, around the sutures. And it's just going to irrigate and clean that out. And again, oral surgeons have known that this has been beneficial for 40 years now, since the 80s, you know, back in the 80s, if you remember my last lecture, uh, oral surgeons were doing this for their patients where they'd make custom trays, like a suck down tray after they got their wisdom teeth taken out and they put uh, glyoxide in there, which is that product you can get at, uh, you know, Walgreens or CVS, which is again, 10% carbon peroxide. Patients would go home and they'd come back to get their stitches out, you know, a week, week or two later, you know, the oral surgeons would be like, dang, your teeth are white, <laughs> right? So um, same thing. So even though Mark, he doesn't have teeth anymore, um, he's just going to wear this in his, his immediate denture every night. And this is the way, you know, kind of the way that this looked as he's walking out the door. Um, so to be continued, right? So hopefully the next time we do, you know, maybe bleaching part three, uh, I'll show you guys how this is healed after a few days. You'll be, you'll be blown away by uh, how nice this looks um, in a few days. So um, guys, I, that's it for the time. I want to thank you all again for coming up for part two. Like I said, we we'll probably have to do a part three. We have a ton of you know, questions, a bunch of things in the chat. And um, please check out you know, SDI's website at polawhite.com. Check out Catapult Education. Um, again, they, they also made this possible. Um, with, uh, with SDI kind of helping to sponsor this, check out their, their education, check out these uh, webinars that are recorded on there. Go ahead, check out my um, Instagram site. That's Miles Cohn, uh, DMD. Um, and also my website, nuancedental.com if you got a question. And um, if anybody's watching, I want you to know, I do read my Instagram messages. I noticed somebody, a few folks messaged me the other day. Sometimes it goes um, to kind of like my spam folder or um, it's kind of like hidden messages. I did see that. I know some of you guys wanted the, um, the cheat sheet that I mentioned last time. I'm going to send that out. It's just been a busy week, but I will get that to you guys. I promise. Um, all right. So this time let's take, uh, we'll go through some Q and a, um, all right. So this first question, um, I, I think I answered this. It says, does the walking bleach, um, to stay bleached through time? And like I said, 85% uh, success rate over 25 years, over a quarter century, 85% success rate. Um, okay, so what do you suggest when a cast metal post is present? Um, okay, that's a, that's a really great question. So again, going back to, you know, when we're doing a single central and they got a cast metal post, this isn't really the, <laughs> I'm gonna get a little off topic here. Um, if you can't have the cast metal post taken out, which is often the case, um, there's many companies that will make a little opaque, a light cured opaque. Um, again, I speak for many companies, so I don't, that aren't like sponsoring this. So I don't really want to like delve into that. Shoot me an email, uh, connect with me on Instagram, and I'll tell you exactly what I use, um, to block out cast metal posts. There's some really economical, low cost methods to do that, that you can just essentially just paint on like a resin, light cure it. And then, um, that'll, that'll block it out, uh, for the most part. Um, another question for in-office bleaching, do you recharge the patient when they return for more sessions? Oh, recharge, uh, recharge, meaning like, do I charge them more money? Yeah, man, <laughs> this is a for-profit business. Yes. I, I recharge them. Um, with a caveat for that one patient, um, Carrie, when I did the in-office bleaching and it didn't really work, I did not recharge her again. I, I made her bleaching tracer free. And I did her, I did another one at no charge for her. She was so nice about it. And I, I felt bad. Um, you know, she was a really nice patient. It's a case by case basis. But if, if it doesn't work the first time, if she's one of those 
And that 5% of people that it just doesn't really work out. No, man, I'm not going to charge them to come back. Um, even if they think it looks good again, I got a conscience. I, I need to sleep at night. Um, so if, if they were, um, yeah, really, really cool. You know, I, I like giving my patients stuff because those are the types of patients that will tell all their buddies like, Hey, you got to go see this guy. He was so cool. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, can you please repeat the name of the bleaching product, uh, that pen for 10 to $20? Pola Luminant, L-U-M-I-N-A-T-E. Spelling is not my fort. So um, Pola Luminant, um, that's what that was. Um, so somebody says, uh, Jesse says, thanks for the lecture. You're welcome. Um, what are expectations with patients that have modeled enamel uh, fluorosis patients? Do they need uh, take home whitening also? Thanks. So with patients that have fluorosis and modeling, that fluorosis and modeling will be amplified, but keep in mind all of the background uh, areas of that tooth will also turn white. So oftentimes whitening is my first line of, my first line of attack to, to get those teeth whiter. From time to time, again, there's other products, you know, I, I don't wanna mention them here because it's not <laughs> really the place. Contact me, I'll tell you what else we use. Um, you know, there's methods to infiltrate the teeth with unfilled resin that you can do. That would be kind of like the next step. <laughs> um, that's a little bit more aggressive. You know, you kind of like do some micro etching of the teeth and use some unfilled resin on there, but yeah, take home bleaching. Um, great for those patients as well. Usually you'll see a nice, a nice result, but you might have to go to step two, which would be the infiltration stuff. Um, so can you use for tetracycline stain cases? What percentage of CP? 100%. Um, if you didn't, that was from an anonymous attendee. If you didn't see my last presentation, we showed um, a nice tetracycline stain case uh, last time around. For tetracycline staining, the only thing I just want to let you aware of is you're looking at probably four to six months. That's a lot of bleaching. And we'll do a lot of in-office whitening, like once per month for like four months with take-home bleaching. So the take home again, 10%, 10% is so good. When in doubt, go with that 10%, it works. Um, for that patient though, we did like a 10% and then we moved it up to like a 22%. She was a beast. She had a beast in how much she could tolerate. Not a, she was a good looking woman and she was not, not unattractive. I mean that. Um, she was a beast in how much she could tolerate. She came in all the time and we did a lot of bleaching and we had really, really great results with her. Sometimes people will tell you like, oh, I tried in office bleaching and the teeth look great. That's temporary. It's just the dehydration. Um, it's just what you're noticing at first. Keep going. They'll get they'll get whiter. Um, they will. Um, okay. Another question: Can you use the bleaching material on myofunctional appliances? Yeah, I suppose any. So these many of these appliances, as long as it's like containing the bleach and it's not like just I, I don't. I, you'd have to be very specific about the myofunctional appliance. But I mean, I use it in a denture. You can use it in an aligner. You can make the custom tray, you know, any sort of like vehicle that you can use. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't put it in like a Nesbit or something because like a, if any, I don't know, you guys might not even know what a Nesbit is. It's essentially like a flipper with like one tooth with like a clasp on either side. Like I wouldn't use it in something like that. I don't know that I would put on a flipper either that's got kind of like open distal areas, you know, that probably wouldn't work that well. Um, so here's a question. Um, uh, what do you think of core whitening? Um, I don't think about it. I don't think of core whitening like ever. <laughs> That's the short, um, sorry, I'm being a little flippant in, <laughs> in, my, in my answer. Um, we had this discussion last time. Um, core white, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not out to bash any companies. There's a lot of great companies that make bleach. From what I understand, core whitening has, um, you know, uh, like a proprietary chemical that's in there. All of the peer reviewed literature shows that core whitening isn't any more effective than any of the other whitening products. Um, the, the most heavily studied um, whitening products are the ones that I use, <laughs> right? They're, that's the, the ones that are in the literature that have, that have peer reviewed evidence-based, you know, dentistry, that's what I go for. And I don't think you'll go wrong if you follow, um, follow those guidelines. Yeah. Core whitening is, it's like, whatever it's got some, I feel like some gimmicky marketing to it. There's no, there's zero science behind core whitening. So that's, that's the last I'll say about core whitening. I, I, I don't, I don't use core whitening in my office. <laughs> um, okay. Is the take-home whitening material okay to use if cavities have not been filled? That's a great question. And this is, um, 
this is going to be a case by case basis too. So you guys saw for, for Mark's case, for example, he had some, you know, big lesions on there. I would not do it in like a gross cavitated lesion. I just wouldn't, if there was like a big, if you can visibly like see an open, I wouldn't do that. That's probably going to be kind of sensitive, you know, just putting any liquid on a tooth like that's probably going to be a little bit sensitive. I wouldn't do it on that. If they've got these like little incipient lesions and i guess this is this is my rule of thumb you guys and this is just what i found has been okay for me i, I should i'll research this a little bit more but my rule of thumb is is if the decay is in the enamel only i'll bleach it's going to be okay if it's extending into the dentin then i'm i have to do i'm going to do some composite first <laughs> um and what i will do for that so okay the question is going to come up somebody's going to ask okay so now you do this filling but now what, you know, now you bleach and now the filling doesn't match. So what I'll do, and again, I speak for companies that make products like this, you know what I mean? I'm not going to mention them today, but um, there are, I will use like a resin, but I won't bond it in, for example, especially if it's on like a front tooth. So I'll, I'll do like a filling, I'll fill it with the resin and maybe just have some mechanical undercuts in there that I can easily just like carve out again. You know what I mean? Um, without removing any additional tooth or I'll air it out right after the tooth is bleached. But I just want to, I got to fill that hole. I don't want to just put bleach into like a cavitated lesion. Um, so I will leave it unbonded. And then after the teeth have gotten to the color that they want, then I'll go in and then I'll actually do the proper, um, proper filling, proper resin. Um, okay. So do you ever have whitening cases that you don't think you can cover with Polo products? Um, to date, um, I've been able to bleach pretty much everybody satisfactorily. Um, again, give me enough time. Never say never, man. I'm, you know, I'm still pretty young. So there's always stuff that I see like day to day. Um, <laughs> there's stuff that, you know, every, every week I still see stuff. They say that you'll prosthodontist, you'll be 55 years old by the time you'll, you, you see something that you'll be like, I haven't seen that before. <laughs> you know, before you, you won't say that anymore. So I'm still saying that. So maybe, I don't know. Um, to date though, you know, the whitening, it's, it's pretty well researched. There's, you know, a ton of evidence and science behind most of the whitening products that are out there. So the stuff works. Um, so what thickness of custom tray? That is a fantastic um, question. Maybe the folks at SDI could answer this. I don't know. It's like a mil, I want to say it's like a millimeter and a half to two, maybe two millimeters. I don't know maybe it's even, yeah, I think maybe like two millimeters. So when you buy, and this is something that wasn't in this presentation, maybe it's going to be in part three. When you buy um, like that Pola kit, like the take home kit inside that kit, there's two, two bleaching um, trays that come with it for the maxilla and the mandible. And they have like a reorder number. Sorry guys, I, I should know that. And I'm just, I'm going to say it's probably two millimeters. I think it's maybe like two millimeters. Um, so that's the one that I use. Um, what do you recommend for somebody who has extreme sensitivity after bleaching? Okay, another great question. Um, shoot me, uh, shoot me a message on Instagram or email, or watch the last. Watch my go to, to Catapult Education. Watch the last webinar. I gave a whole rundown of what I do in the weeks leading up to the bleaching. What I do like in the hour before the bleaching. What I do during the bleaching, and then what I do after the bleaching. Um, but just to give you a quick rundown. After the bleaching, um, uh, SDI makes a product called Soothe. It's potassium nitrate, the same stuff that's like in, in many of the toothpaste, like the desensitizing toothpaste. Um, the reason most of that desensitizing toothpaste doesn't work is because patients brush with it and then they rinse, they rinse it out immediately. They don't let it set there. They don't let it absorb. The Soothe is really nice and it's called Soothe, S-O-O-T-H-E, <laughs> question mark, Soothe, yeah. So it's just a gel that they can use in their, in their trays and they use it for like 20 minutes, you know, once or twice a day in lieu of the bleaching afterwards. And that has, it just kind of soaks in and does exactly what it says. Soothe. There's no, there's no mystery to the name. It soothes the teeth. So that's actually, that's really, really nice. Um, so somebody said, I missed your first webinar. Is there a recording or other opportunities to catch that session? Yeah. And Lisa, you can just, that's available on Catapult Education's website, correct? Yeah, if you look in the chat box, everybody, I paste or I posted a link to the whitening part one. I posted a link to it on catapulteducation.com as well as directly on our YouTube channel. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then uh, the last question here, it says, are take-home bleaching no rinse? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure what that question means. Um, so, I mean, when they when they take the bleaching home, they put it in the trays and the, it sits in the trays, you know, for anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes to a couple hours to overnight. It depends on the concentration of the bleach that you get. It depends on the, the formulation, whether it's hydrogen peroxide or carbamide peroxide. Um, but you wear it in a tray um, or you wear it like in the, um, the pole of light that I showed you, that kind of pre-made tray. And then after that comes out, I mean, you rinse it out of the tray and you can, you'd rinse your teeth off, but um, you, you, it stays, you know, it needs contact time against, against the teeth. Um, the only other one was that uh, the pole illuminate, like that pen that you can paint onto the teeth. Um, but with that, you don't rinse that off. You kind of, you kind of paint and go, and then you just leave it on there. Um, you know, at least I do for the day. Um, okay. So is that, I think, I think that was all the questions. I think that was all the questions. Um, again, I just want to thank you all for hanging out, coming to check this out. Please connect with me again. Um, you know, maybe SDI and, and catalog, maybe they'll, they'll have me back for another <laughs> part three. seems like every time I do this, I get really great questions and I have to add four or five slides. And so this thing started out, I remember the first time they asked me to do this, I was like, how am I going to make a you know, a 45 minute presentation on this. And it ended up becoming this two hour, two part thing. And now I, I really think I got to make a part three. There's so many great questions that I get every time. And please guys send me your questions and I, I, I will include them in the, in the next, next go around. And then, um, yeah, if, if I didn't answer any of your questions, check out that first, uh, check out that first recorded webinar. And I, I hope you'll find it there.